Sound check. Check. Hello, hello. Sound, sound. Can you hear me out there in on the interwebs? <laughs> I heard some yeses. <laughs> All right. Uh, fantastic. Welcome back to our penultimate day of uh, Chem 1. Um, such a crazy ride uh, to try to get through this class in eight weeks. Um, today we're going to do our last topic uh, <laughs> on the second to last day. Tomorrow will be um, tomorrow we're going to we're going to do a review and I'm going to encompass some of it in applications to biology. So we'll look at acid base and electrochemistry and uh, thermodynamics in the context of biochemistry, because many of you are interested in uh, molecular biology. So it'll be uh, a review and applications uh, to the stuff you're gonna see in your next courses. So you remember when you get there, uh, what you learned in Chem 1. And I encourage you, um, uh, if you v are very much interested in the way bodies work, human or any life works, uh, just go into chemistry. It is all chemistry. Um, the We understand life on the actual atomic molecular scale, and everyone who is studying it is studying the chemistry of life uh, uh, rather than describing we used to just describe how things happen. The mitochondria produces energy in the cell. Uh, now we know exactly how it does it on to right down to which electron goes where. So the idea of understanding chemistry is important. Uh, come on in. There's another guest. Uh, oh, it's just Leo. <laughs> Never mind, just Leo. <laughs> you can come in to people entering the room. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So today we're going to talk about uh, electrochemistry. This is the last topic. You have one homework on electrochemistry. And I'll remind you again, do that homework if you do nothing else, because the uh, this is the last topic and it's right at the end. I'm not going to ask you anything different on the exam than what is on that homework. OK, so you can focus there and then go back and uh, study the rest of the uh, semester as well. So. Um, we're at the point uh, we need to talk about this last topic uh, because this is uh, fundamental to how your cells work, how you produce energy in your cells and how your brain works. All this stuff relies on electron transport, electron electrochemical signals, and they rely on uh, electronics to a certain extent. Uh, we do act like little batteries. Uh, is there, uh, we'll see that tomorrow. Uh, has anybody seen the Matrix series of uh, movies? Not too many. The, uh, in the Matrix, the whole premise is uh, AIs take over the world. They take human beings and they use them as batteries. They use them as power sources. So they put them in these, uh, these little uh, cocoons, uh, feed them nutrients, and just use the electrical signals to, to run uh, society, to run their AI uh, society. Um, and they immerse, so the, so the people don't die, they immerse them in an artificial reality. Uh, so, uh, but there is some truth to that. Uh, but there's also a lot of garbage. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, so let's talk about uh, some electric. What is going on? I'm sorry, we're way in the middle of this whole thing. How did that slide get there? Uh, sorry, I, I was editing, as you know, right to the last minute, and I messed up the order of slides, apparently. So what we're going to talk about is electrons moving from one compound to the next. And that means we have to decide we're going to talk about ions a lot and which are the thermodynamically favored ions. So the whole idea of current flow in our bodies and electrons moving is electrons uh, 
uh, the, the more favored ions being produced. And the electrons move in response to the thermodynamics of the more favored equilibria, where the more favored ions are. So we need to decide how that works. So if you were to take uh, a piece of zinc, so this is a solid piece of zinc and a solid piece of copper and put it in a beaker, there's the potential to have zinc ions. So there might be zinc ions and there may be copper ions in solution. Uh, if there are copper ions, the solution is actually blue. Copper ions uh, do impart a blue color. Uh, zinc uh, doesn't, that would be a transparent solution. Cast blue here just because uh, we're portraying water. So two water solutions in there. And the question is, uh, what's favored, the metal or the ion? And more importantly, maybe compared to the two, which is the more favored ion or which is the more favored metal? Essentially, where would the electrons like to come to rest? Would they like to come to a rest on zinc so that zinc stays zinc metal? Or are they happier somewhere else and zinc ions are the favored state? So those electrons have to find another place to live. So uh, let's start at the standard state. That's fair. This metal, those pieces of metal are already in the standard state. Can't be anything else. What is the standard state? If you take nothing else home from Chem 1, take home the fact the standard state is simply refers to equilibria, to chemical reactions, where every concentration or pressure is one. It's very simple. And pure solids and pure liquids are just there as pure solids. They need to be present so that they can participate in the thermodynamic equilibria, but they, there's not a concentration. They don't appear in equilibrium expressions. So copper metal and zinc metal are already in their standard state by virtue of being there. <laughs> All they have to do is show up. <laughs> That's the easy part. The ions must be present at one molar to be in the standard state. So let's put them in their standard state right now, one molar of each of those. And why do we do that? Because we're going to compare zinc solutions to copper solutions, and you can't do it unless you, you they're the same. They're, they're some standard state, standard basis for comparison. I can't compare zinc ions at half a molar to copper ions at 10 molar. That wouldn't be fair. So the standard state says everybody's at one molar. If they're there at one molar, this is the kind of interaction we're talking about, which is favored, zinc metal or zinc ions. Uh, that is written as an oxidation. We've talked about that now, and we're going to be more formal about oxidation now. We've, we were able to determine oxidation numbers. In an ion, it's obvious. <laughs> the oxidation number of zinc is plus two there. Nothing to hide. But I've written it as an oxidation. So going in this direction, the oxidation number of zinc, all pure substances in their standard state have oxidation number zero. So zinc metal, oxidation number zero on those atoms. These ions, oxidation number two, that's an increase in oxidation number. An increase in oxidation number means oxidation. That's how we define it. The other way is kind of easier to remember. Here I've written this reaction. I just did this arbitrary just so I could have both of them on the board. Uh, there can be an equilibrium between those two, and there certainly is. Uh, but I've written this one as a reduction, just so we could highlight uh, the two. Here, the oxidation number of copper was reduced. So we call that a reduction. That's pretty easy to remember. Went from plus two to zero. So uh, very simple, very straightforward. Uh, let's put... Uh, the, these aren't balanced. You know, when we balance chemical reactions, we, we don't include the electrons, seldom include the electrons. But this one doesn't make much sense. Or neither of them make much sense without the electrons. So uh, let's just write them as zinc going to the ion being oxidized. And then we have to find some place for these electrons to live. They can't be free, but we're, we know they're there. They have the potential to go somewhere. If this happens, we got to take care of those guys. And if this happens, they must, this copper must have picked up electrons from somewhere. 
So that emphasizes it's the fact that electrons are doing, are the, are the uh, mechanism of oxidation and reduction. If you add electrons to something, that will reduce its charge. It will reduce its oxidation number. So reduction is the addition of electrons, thereby reducing the oxidation number. Oxidation electrons are taken away. So you took two electrons from the zinc to form zinc plus, and now you've got to find a home for those two electrons. There's probably an oxidizer somewhere that pulled those electrons off, and it has them now. So it oxidized the zinc metal. So we have everybody in their standard state here, and if we're in the standard state, then we can talk about which is favored. Are the zinc ions or the zinc metal, the copper ions or the copper metal favored? We can do that thermodynamically by talking about the free energy difference between zinc and zinc ions and a pair of electrons or copper metal and copper ions and a pair of electrons. And we can legitimately put that zero there because we have one molar concentrations and the pure metal appearing. So that means we can also come up, uh, let me go back one more time and just emphasize, if we can get a delta G, that determines K. These two numbers are locked together. If you know the standard state free energy, you know the position of equilibria. And delta G less than zero means it's spontaneous, but we know all spontaneous means is products are favored at equilibrium. Once I get there, Standard state is not equilibrium. It has the potential, delta G less than zero, says downhill is towards products. That's the potential. That's where I'm going to go. Here's where I'm going to land. K, bigger than one, more products than reactants. Products over reactants. Products are bigger than reactants. That makes the ratio bigger than one. Okay, there, a summary of... Uh, most of our thermodynamics in terms of a slightly different uh, context. This is called recontextualization. <laughs> if, you're in, if you're into learning science, and I hope some of you go into cognitive science, it's a beautiful thing. Um, seeing something in a different context helps you remember it better and understand the concept better. So here we have the same concept in a different context of oxidation and reduction. So uh, these two are favored. We can't have free electrons dancing around those. So these, in a certain sense, are incomplete. They're going to have to happen in pairs. Uh, oxidation is going to have to happen in conjunction with a reduction. Those electrons are going to have to go somewhere. And these electrons are have to come from somewhere. So they have to happen in conjunction. So let's let them do it. Let's put them, instead of two beakers, let's put them in the same beaker. So now I have a zinc and a copper uh, piece of metal and the copper and zinc ions at standard state. And you saw that little animation there. Let's uh, run it again, because it happened fast. Can you go just to the um, screen for a second, uh, Sydney? And we'll, do we have reasonable resolution? on the screen. So uh, you just see the output of the of the tablet. This thing, by the way, is just a giant tablet. It's an 85 inch diagonal iPad. <laughs> so I can do all the swipes and run all the apps. Uh, it's just a big one. So that animation was showing you something that could happen in solution. And I'll do it again. So here we have the copper ions and the zinc ions. And now they can interact. They're in the same uh, beaker. And something that can happen is a copper ion, one of them has formed copper metal. So this reaction has ap actually happened in solution. The copper has plated out, we call that. It electroplated. A surface of the zinc is being covered by a layer of copper. We're plating copper onto the zinc. Okay? That happened because at the same time, 
a zinc ion, some of the zinc dissolves into zinc ions. So come back to me. So we have that, and now we've done them as a pair. So where did these two electrons come from? Well, the copper came over here, played it out. It has two electrons that a zinc solid gave up and went into solution. So now we see that that electron transfer happened, and indeed, zinc was oxidized. It did go from a piece of metal to an ion, and the copper ion went to a piece of copper metal in a different place over here because that's where it had to get those electrons. But the oxidation and the reduction happened as a pair in solution. And is that the spontaneous direction in the universe? It could happen the other way. It could, the zinc could play it out on the copper metal and more copper ions produced. We need to determine which are the favored ions. What I'm saying is zinc is the favored ion because it's being produced. Copper is being used up and going back to the metal. And uh, I'm going to say that formally. So we see where the what happened to the electrons now. They cancel out. Those two electrons are the same. Those two went on to those two and uh, or went on to that copper and made that copper metal. So when this happens, the zinc concentration goes up. If it were at the standard state, it would go higher than one molar. The copper concentration goes down. So that would decrease from one molar until you get to equilibrium. If that's the spontaneous direction, and let's just say it, <laughs> remove the suspense. <laughs> yes, that is the spontaneous direction. That is the way the reaction will go if you let it uh, be. The zinc ion is the uh, favored ion in solution. So if you have all these things together in one beaker, a piece of zinc, a piece of copper, copper ions, and zinc ions, Zinc ion concentration will increase. Copper ion concentration will decrease because that is the favored direction. That means I should write it in the favored direction. This isn't a chemical reaction. This is just all the, all the ions in solution. So let's write what happens. Let's write a complete chemical reaction. These are two half reactions. Half of this is an oxidation. Half of this is a reduction. They have to happen together. So let's just write them together in a chemical reaction. And what we've discussed tells you, well, this is the chemical reaction we should write. Or we, we can write it in either direction. I'm going to write it in this direction because that's the spontaneous direction. If copper metal is in, in contact with zinc, sorry, I said it wrong. If copper ions are in a solution with zinc metal, copper metal will be formed and zinc will dissolve. That's the favored direction of the universe. Zinc concentration increases, copper ion concentration decreases till we get a K that's bigger than one. Okay, so this whole idea of oxidation and reduction and spontaneity, which ions are favored, and where do the equilibria lie? Tells us about where the electrons are going to go if given the chance. So if given the opportunity, the electrons would rather reside on the copper. So, you know, I don't like to use those words, happier or would rather result, reside. I use words that are boring and more dry like, the equilibrium favors the products. <laughs> products are favored at equilibrium. Copper metal is favored at equilibrium. Zinc ions are favored at equilibrium. But if you'd like, the electrons want to find the copper. They want to leave the zinc metal and find the copper metal. So in a sense, copper metal is a, an electron sink. Electrons, if you have a piece of zinc and a piece of copper, 
the natural thing is for the electrons to go towards the copper. There's a potential difference between them. And there is a real measurable potential difference. And you can uh, write that out. Uh, first, let's just note, uh, since I've write that, written this chemical uh, reaction here, that oxidation and reduction always uh, occur in pairs. And that means oxida if there's an oxidation, there's a reduction. So some there's something that's doing the oxidation. Copper is the oxidizer because it oxidizes zinc. It takes those electrons away from zinc. It makes this happen. It makes the oxidation happen. So, uh, and I'm writing it like this because this kind of harkens back to our acid base thing. Acid base, we were saying, who gets the proton? Where does the proton end up? Here, we're saying, where do the electrons end up? They go from a reducer to an oxidizer. So an electrons were transferred from the zinc to the copper to make zinc ions and copper metal. And if you run it in reverse, of course, those two things change roles, just like weak acid and conjugate base. So that should look somewhat familiar to you. Um, but we're saying, in general, copper metal is the favored. That's the more friendly to electrons. Maybe it's a better neighborhood. I don't know. <laughs> the school systems are so much better on the copper. <laughs> As you know, uh, quality of the public education is the number one driver of a real estate price. They say location, location, location in real estate. But what they mean is location uh, in proximity to a good school. Everybody wants to have a good school system. Um, so uh, maybe that's the case for copper and electrons are voting with their feet. <laughs> hmm. Should write some of these down. Uh, so let's do this. Let's go back to two separate beakers again. So does the copper, are the electrons so much more favored? Is that so much more favorable state that we could get the electrons to leave the zinc metal and travel outside the beaker? <laughs> that would be exciting. So let's do that. Let's put two metals here. And I, I wish we could do demos because uh, I can bring up a couple demos, uh, as you know, and show them to you. Um, they're not tremendously exciting, but at least we could see light bulbs lighting up and stuff like that. Um, but I'm telling you, this is where the electrons want to land, the copper metal. Can we get them to go from this zinc piece of metal to that copper piece of metal outside the beakers? Well, let's give them a path to do that. So let's electrically connect these two beakers. We'll do that in two ways. We'll connect them with what we call a salt bridge. So this will allow the ions, copper ions and zinc ions, to uh, change sign, to essentially migrate. And let's put a wire between those two uh, electrodes. We can start calling them electrodes now, the piece of zinc and the piece of copper. And if we do that, we have this feeling that those electrons will move from one to the other because copper metal is favored. The copper ion concentration will decrease here and the zinc ion concentration will increase here provided we have this salt bridge. So the salt bridge is going to balance the ionic strength. It's going to make sure you can't just pull two positive charges in or out of solution. So this salt bridge has ions in it that will maintain a ion concentration balance so that the total charge on those uh, isn't changing. The, the, the kind of ion could change. Like these could be uh, chloride ions helping you and sodium ions helping you balance the charge. So essentially completing the circuit. Okay. 
So we have this we have this uh, idea that that will happen, but uh, does it happen? And and uh, yes, I mean you know the answer is yes. Uh, this should be looking like a battery to you. This is how we make batteries. So that will provide a pathway for electrons and they will spontaneously travel there. That is the direction they want to go. How hard, how big is that potential difference? How much can we get them to go from one side to the other? Well, we know the free energy difference, the free energy difference between the uh, copper ion, copper metal and the zinc ion, zinc metal, the free energy difference between those is the amount of available work the system can provide. That is, it can force, it can do work, force those electrons from one side to the other. The electrons spontaneously go and release their free energy. And that release in free energy can light up a light bulb in between the two. So that release in free energy, we really get it. We see it instantly in a light bulb lighting up if we put a light bulb between those two electrodes. There's such a potential difference between the two that not only do the electrons flow, they can do the work of lighting up a light bulb at the same time or moving a little motor uh, in your uh, car or uh, whatever. You can get that, um, you can use the current that flows to do actual work. So now we see again an example of the free energy of a system translated into something we can use. And as you know, I think I've said this before, if you are going to go into chemistry, uh, battery chemistry is the most important thing in our society right now. Probably the best thing we can do to reduce our carbon imprint and get the, the planet uh, back in balance is find a way to store and use uh, uh, electric energy. We can make, people have this idea that we can't make enough. We can make way more electricity than we need. There's no shortage of that. The problem is making it when you need it. So make it, store it, use it. Uh, that's where batteries come in. That's where we'll need to store the energy. And uh, lithium ion technology, that's our best. And now you understand lithium ion. Hmm. <laughs> there must be lithium ions involved with lithium ion batteries. And indeed there are, but that's our latest uh, battery technology, uh, but it's already quite old and there hasn't been a breakthrough in quite some time. So uh, please, one of you uh, or you uh, make that breakthrough for us and save society. <laughs> Be the saviors. So in this beaker, this reaction happens. In this beaker, that reaction happens. And the free energy is such that the elect we can make them happen in separate beakers. We can pull that free energy out by making the electrons go the pathway that we want them to go and use their free energy to do work. So uh, we call these things half cells. That's half the battery. That's the other half of the battery. That's a half cell reaction that's an oxidation. That's a half cell reaction that's a reduction. That's how it will always occur. One half cell, as you know, these things have to happen in pairs. Excuse me, keep tripping over that. Uh, these things have to happen in pairs. One side of your battery is where the oxidation occurs. One side is where the reduction occurs. And uh, the, the battery people call those anode and cathode. So where the reduction occurs is called the cathode. And where the oxidation occurs is the anode. Um, I always remember those because uh, both of these start with a vowel. So oxidation and anode, and both of these start with a consonant, uh, uh, cathode and reduction. Um, uh, but that's just battery technology. It's not something super important uh, unless you're gonna go into this uh, that you know that. If we were in uh, the regular fall semester, uh, you know, that might be an exam question. <laughs> You know, the definition of cathode and anode, so you know that uh, that's not going to occur. Don't forget it. Well, forget it if you want to. Like I said, it really only matters if you're going to build batteries uh, in your next life. 
So the electrons do indeed flow from one side to the other and make that oxidation occur. And in doing that, you'll be able to, here I have uh, a voltmeter. You could put a voltmeter and measure the potential energy difference, the free energy difference, the potential energy difference between a copper electrode and a zinc electrode. You actually get, it actually is downhill. There's a potential for those electrons to go downhill and electrical potential is measured in something we call volts. The voltage is the potential difference between uh, uh, a high uh, potential place, like high um, potential energy, gravity, going downhill to low potential energy. So your house works because there, there's a high potential energy difference between the electric wire that comes into your house and the earth, ground. All those electrons flow from the electric power plant, which is making the high potential energy, and they throw through your house, through your light bulbs, into the ground. And then technically, ground is the salt bridge. They go back to the power plant <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> they go. Uh, um, that's, a, that's a really cool and, and beautiful thing, how those things uh, happen. It's a global um, free energy reaction. And of course, those electrons are the same electrons. Those electrons that left here are the electrons uh, that ended up there. Uh, I shouldn't say that identically. Um, I'm not even going to get into it. Uh, <laughs> the electrons are transferred is all we need to know. Okay. Uh, if you did this exact one with under standard states, that's one molar, that's one molar, then you would measure the voltage. And I've given it the symbol uh, delta script E. So the potential difference between the anode and the cathode or the oxidation and reduction, you can measure on a voltmeter, it would be 1.1 volts if you actually set this up. Uh, in the lab. And that's one of the demos we would do. Uh, it's boring. We would just have this and this and the camera would zoom in on a voltmeter and it would say 1.1. 1 .1. Um, so uh, it actually can be done. We would do it with a light bulb too. We would put the light bulb uh, in there and make that go. So uh, we write this cell notation. So uh, since these things are happening in literally different beakers, uh, we use this notation uh, with these uh, vertical lines, these bars, to represent the different phases and the different compartments of the reaction. So there's two phases here, zinc metal and zinc ions, the solid and the aqueous phase. Then there's a salt bridge, these two bars, salt bridge, and the copper beaker, and the copper electrode. So uh, there's an oxidation half cell, a reduction half cell, and in between them, a salt bridge. So that's the notation we will use. Again, more important, uh, if you are going to go in and think uh, hard about batteries. We're interested in the thermodynamics, the free energy, the oxidation and reduction um, more than the details here. Uh, if it were fall semester, we would do more details. Not that you're getting gypped or anything. Um, we're still technically covering it. We want, we want, when you get your credit from UC Berkeley, you want to say that, okay, I did all that stuff. Um, but I get to choose how much detail we do it in. <laughs> so, um, uh, that's uh, the prerogative we have. So what we can do, since we saw there was a total voltage, it turns out we're going to end up assigning the half cells a voltage, a potential. So we're going to write potentials for just the half reaction. And we can do that because we'll have a standard state and we'll compare everything to a standard state. And that standard reduction is the reduction of hydrogen ions, H pluses, acid solution, to hydrogen gas. So picking up these two electrons. We'll compare all of our oxidations and reductions to that one so that we can assign 
the half cells of voltage. And then that's super useful because then we can, we can uh, mix and match uh, half cells and know what the total voltage would be because we can get tables here. Everybody compared, as long as we compare everybody to the same uh, half cell electrode, pick that as our standard electrode, then we can compare individual half cells. And when we do that, we will tabulate these numbers and notice uh, the stronger oxidizers are up, the stronger reducers are, uh, are, are down, and the um, voltages kind of uh, reflect that. So a positive voltage, and now we're going to start getting into a sign convention that's going to bother us, because a positive voltage means the reaction wants to go in that direction. Uh, and we've been talking all along that that would mean a negative free energy difference. So now we have to keep that sign difference. Positive voltage means I go. Negative free energy difference means there's the potential to go. So, uh, and that is just a matter of convenience because you read positive numbers on your voltmeter and that's going. <laughs> so you say, okay, that's the spontaneous direction but it's a positive sign. So we have to keep track of that. Uh, so that means this one is not the likely one. This is the likely one. That's the positive voltage. So uh, these are called reduction potentials. It's the potential for that reduction. And we always write them as reductions. So notice these are all adding an electron, reducing the oxidation number. So these are all standard reduction potentials measured relative to the hydrogen electrode. So how do you do that? Um, here's the chemical reaction. There's the little battery notation. And the voltage there is uh, 0 0.1. And you probably already see that that's the difference between those two numbers. So we can subtract the products minus reactants kind of thing is in here. And we'll do that here in detail in just a minute. Here, I just wanted to make that connection because the negative sign thing came up right away. If I want to convert between free energy and voltage, I can do it. There has to be a relationship. We know that there is. Here is the relationship. The standard free energy difference is N, the number of electrons that are transferred per mole of reaction. So uh, this is a two electron transfer. So N would be two. F is Faraday's constant. That's a new constant. That's the charge on a mole of electrons. So the charge on a mole of electrons is measured in something called Coulombs. That's another unit. That's the charge on one electron. So electron charge per mole is a Faraday. And that converts between voltage and free energy. And the important thing is that negative sign there. Positive voltages are spontaneous reactions. I'm going to take these off because they're banging. You might even be able to hear them banging against my shirt on the mic. Sorry. Oh, poopy. I can't do it <laughs> because of all the loops. Okay, I'll do that later. I'm making it worse. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's uh, think about it. What forms when copper metal is in contact with H2SO4, a strong acid solution, at one molar? What happens in that solution? Is our copper ions formed? Is hydrogen gas formed? Or does nothing happen? Let's think about that for a minute. And we will take a vote. So that is saved. 
Um, and you guys are my group, so let's talk about it together.
Uh, okay, we're back. Uh, let's see what you're thinking. Oh my goodness. Uh, equal distribution between all three answers, A, B, and C. Uh, so you need uh, the thinking here. We have some students in the room. So we were talking, oh no. What does that blinking circle mean? Uh, stop doing it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, does that mean there's a poll in progress? Maybe. I think that's all that meant. OK, sorry. Um, so uh, let's go through it together. Um, here are some possible uh, answers. We didn't put those on the board because uh, we were using the board. Uh, we could try to evaluate them. Uh, so copper here. So uh, here's the. Here's the deal. These two things come from uh, the slide previous that said that these potentials are like are this. This is the positive potential. This is the spontaneous direction. This is the reference. So it has zero potential. Essentially, it'll go either way. It'll go, it, it, it will, uh, it's the indifferent state. Um, you could think of it by itself, it's not gonna do anything or something like that. It has to be nudged by something else, something that has a potential. These are, remember these are half cells, so none of them go on their own. They have to pair up. So the question is, is this a pair that's going to go? Well, in solution, you put H2SO4 in solution, I forget what the animation is here, but you put H2SO4, in solution, that means, and I told you that's a strong acid, that means <laughs> you get H pluses plus SO4 minus twos. So you get H pluses. Now we actually know that uh, we talked about polyprotic acids. One proton comes off. Only the first proton is the strong acid. It actually leaves a lot of in fact, I'm going to write it that way. Just HSO4 minus is the first deprotonation. It's, it's a polyprotic, and this is the one that's strong. The next one is a little reticent to come off. So, uh, you, but you have H pluses in solution, and copper metal is in the beaker. The question is do those two things? react is there a potential from the electrons to go from the copper metal to the h pluses and this is telling you well wait a minute the positive the way things want to go is copper ions accepting electrons the copper metal is the more stable compared to anything below it on the on the uh, chart. So anything of lower potential, this guy would win. He would drive anything of lower potential the other direction. So this would be driven in the other direction. But that means it's the copper metal that's favored and the H plus that are favored in solution at equilibrium. So if you put copper metal in some acid, that's the direction things want to go. That is the spontaneous direction of things. And that spontaneous direction says that's a positive E 
negative delta G, I favor this side. This is the favored re uh, side of the reaction. And that's what you had. You had copper, metal, and H+. plus. So nothing happens. That's a boring one. OK? OK, so I think you probably saw this coming. We'll just talk about this one together. Um, we have uh, the other one, put zinc metal. So now you put zinc metal in solution, uh, strongly acidic solution. So you have H pluses. Now the H plus zinc is here at the lower uh, voltage, the negative voltage state. That means going the other way is spontaneous compared to anything above it on the table, the things of higher potential. So this reaction is going to go in the other direction, and the sum of those things is going to be zinc metal reacting with those ions to form zinc ions and hydrogen gas. I reversed this one, so I reversed the sign of the potential, and I added the two half cells to get the potential difference between zinc and acid and zinc ions and hydrogen gas. So in this case, the zinc metal, and if we were in the lab, we would do this. We would drop some zinc into acid, and you would see it bubbling and dissolving. The, um, you would form both those things, zinc ion and hydrogen gas. OK. Uh, so uh, now we can do the, the same. We can play kind of the same games. Which of these would oxidize H2? And we've already kind of talked about that. To oxidize H2, I have to increase its oxidation number. I have to turn H2 into H pluses. Will any of these substances do that? And we've talked about it now already. Uh, basically, we just look at the results of the last two. Uh, and we say, well, in this case, this one wants to go in that direction. It'll force that in the opposite direction. This is a good reducing agent. Copper ions are a good reducing agent. And we know that because it's high up on the potential. It has the high potential to go that way. So copper ions, in effect, are looking for electrons. They're going to go grab electrons from whatever they can. That's what that positive potential tells you. So copper ions will reduce. You'll get a positive voltage if you do that and make hydrogen ions. OK, wonderful. Uh, so this is interesting. Let's just talk about this briefly in our small groups. So now I have copper ions on this side in a non-standard state, tenth of a molar, and uh, one molar on the other side. And I've even drawn this one darker blue because copper ions are darker blue and there's a higher concentration over here. And I want to ask you, if I, if I do set that up, will current flow there? So if I have the same ion, so if I let this go the right side as you're facing it, this one, will that be get will that get uh, darker blue unchanged because the same ele electrode, or will it be get lighter? So think about that for a second, and we'll take a vote. <laughs> ben, you're right here. Ben, you look much younger in person. <laughs> Oops. Thank you.
Let's see what you're thinking uh, after you've uh, talked about this together. The results are, oh my goodness, <laughs> the results are just like the last one are uh, equal. We can't decide uh, uh, which way the reaction goes. Um, and uh, that's the same, that's, uh, we were having the same uh, situation here. We were struggling with what's going on. So uh, the, the question is this, there's, uh, we'll talk about it together. You have copper ions here at high concentration here and at low concentration here. Um, uh, remember when we started here, we said we had a copper electrode and copper ions and zinc electrode and zinc ions in different beakers and nothing would happen. But we had this idea there was the potential for something to happen. So when we put them in the same beaker, that same thing happened. And then we said, well, we can keep them in the separate beakers but give it a different pathway for it to happen. Make the electrons go through the wire. So if there's the potential for that thing to happen, that is, if it's thermodynamically favored, if free energy is downhill, it's gonna wanna happen, and it's gonna wanna happen whether it's in the same beaker or different beakers. If there's a pathway for it to happen, that is, if the electrons have to go through a wire, or if they can just be in contact with the ions in, in the same beaker, it's going to want to happen. There's a free energy difference between those things. There's a free energy difference, even though there's no electrochemical potential difference, that half cell and that half cell, if we just wrote them in their standard state, 0.1 molar and 0.1 molar, nothing would happen. Those have the same potential. But what if you put those things in the same beaker, so you just drilled a hole here or something, and you let them mix, essentially break down the wall. If you break down the wall, what's going to happen? They will mix. That concentration goes down. That concentration will go up. It's like the gas expanding against a vacuum. That will go to maximize the number of microstates. That is the copper ions spread out equally among the sides. That will go if... That's the thermodynamically favored state. This, the universe hates this. The universe hates that the ions are all over here and not here. You've stuck them there without a wire. If you put them in the same beaker, the universe can't do anything about it. But you give them a path. Entropy says, the way I want that to be is equally spread out, maximize the microstates. So this is an entropically driven interaction. So the enthalpy part, the energy part that you associate with going downhill is less there because they're the same ion in the same electrode. But the entropic part, and remember delta G is the delta H minus T delta S. There is the entropic contribution to doing work, to getting some free energy out, and that will happen. These things want to mix, and they're going to mix whatever pathway you give them to mix. So the concentration difference on either side creates the potential. It's an entropic potential, in a sense, and that goes. So the concentration goes down here. Up here, electrons do flow so that these copper ions decrease in concentration, and you get one over here for every one that you use up over here and the concentrations equalize. It's a concentration cell. And yes, the concentration is sufficient to drive the reaction. That's just a beautiful and discussion of entropy works if you give it a pathway <laughs> to do so. That's just lovely. <laughs> OK. We can make it go in the opposite direction if we do the work. So clearly, in this situation, the uh, the in the standard state, the way this reaction wants to go, uh, we've talked about the copper ions uh, uh, grab electrons from zinc metal and form zinc ions. So that's the direction we want to go. 
So zinc ion concentration increases, copper ion concentration decreases if we just put a wire there. But we could put a battery there. We could put a bigger potential source and make it go the other way if we want to, okay? So bigger potential difference will make it go. So we can force the reaction to go the other direction. We can charge the battery. <laughs> we can get zinc metal formed here and uh, make our copper ions over there. So that potential increases again. So charge up the battery, sure. Put a bigger battery there or plug it into the wall and make it go the other way. So this is how you would charge a battery. It's called electrolysis. Go back the other way. And all you have to do is put a bigger uh, battery there, a bigger source than the other side. And of course, you could do it all in the same solution if you wanted to or in half cells. And if you did it in the same solution, then it's obvious what the chemical reaction is. Uh, it's the same one. We can get the electrons to go from one to the other. But if we want to make the, the uh, electrons go this way, we have to force them up free energy hill to go that way. In general, we always write these cells so that the electrons, uh, and we write the notation so that electrons are going from uh, left to right. So we always draw the beaker pictures and all that in general. So yeah, the spontaneous direction is shown going from left to right, just like the chemical reaction. Um, on the exam, uh, you'll have some beakers and we'll put stuff in both the beakers and you'll have to tell us which direction they go. But if it was just the conventional way, it would be uh, left to right. Okay. So in that case, the... Oxidation would occur over here, so we'd have to call that the anode, and the reduction would occur over here, so we'd have to call that the cathode, and we would have to put in more than 1.1 uh, .1 volts. This battery would have to be bigger than a 1.1 volt battery to make it go back the other direction. If it weren't, you would charge that battery uh, up to 1.1 volts with an electron with a current going in the other direction. We call that current flow. We call that the overvoltage. Um, this is uh, important for you to, to take home. Um, an amp is the unit of current flow. So you should have that in the back of your mind. It's one Coulomb, that's the charge on an electron, per second. So a Coulomb per second is the flow of electrons, and we call those amps. They're different than voltage. A lot of people have trouble with that. This is the potential for them to flow. This is an actual measurement of the flow. I'm trying to decide what to do here. Um, I, I, I don't. I, I want to see where we can safely stop, and I've kind of said everything um, that will appear on the exam. Um, I kind of do want to just stop with the real material today. Um, so we can either. Uh, I'm. I'm going to skip by. Uh, these are calculations. I'm going to skip by them. Maybe we'll do them uh, in a review later. Um, I forget if I gave you the slides or not. Uh, are these? Uh, these slides probably aren't in the ones that are in the handout. Uh, so maybe we should provide these to you as a handout, um, or maybe afterwards, uh, maybe I'll record, I could do that. I could record myself going through these and you could play it back, uh, later, uh, or, uh, we'll have Ben go through it. He'll record <laughs> it. Ben just came in. Uh, you can't see him. He's down here. Uh, one of your GSIs has been remote. Uh, were you in San Diego? You were down South yeah, somewhere. Yeah. He was in San Diego the whole time, but now is, uh, back with his youthful vigor here with us. So I am going to, uh, I'm going to skip through these simply because I want to show you uh, the, the relationship. Um, I just want to make that concentration cell thing 
uh, a little more um, quantitative. Uh, that is, we talked about concentration in that qualitative way. Oh, sure, it'll go there till it mixed. Uh, we can measure the, the actual voltage of that concentration cell. And I just want to show you how to do that um, in, in case that appears on the exam. And I'm, that's what I'm trying to rack my brain. Did I put that in there or not? Um, so uh, just in case, I will show you. So um, we, we had that little bitty table of reduction potentials, just three of them, copper, uh, hydrogen, and zinc. But you can do it for uh, hundreds of different uh, oxidations and reductions. Okay, so here is a table of standard reduction potentials, and these are all positive. That means these all want to go this way. These guys all want electrons. They grab electrons from things, and when they pull electrons off something, they oxidize it, and they are reduced. So these are good oxidizers because they have the potential to grab electrons. That's the downhill nature of the universe. And here's uh, half the table. Uh, I'll show you some below the hydrogen electrode. So here are the one, here's the hydrogen electrode, the reference, and all these guys below it will, the, the potential is for them to go this direction. So these are good, uh, so these are good reducers. They want to go in this direction. Anything higher on the table will just make anything lower on the table go the other way. So higher stuff on the table just forces everything lower on the table the other way. So you can always compare and say, if I have two half cells, which one will go? Well, the higher one up on the table makes the lower one go the other way. So... Um, uh, we'll we'll do this. So here's a chemical reaction. Does this chemical reaction go one way or the other? Uh, it's an unbalanced, it's a redox chemical reaction. Something's oxidized and something's reduced. Uh, we're going to balance it using the half cells from the table. So it's uh, manganese, um, uh, the permanganate ion and the bromine ion reacting in solution. Will they form bromine gas and uh, the manganese ion? So that's a reduction. You could draw the Lewis structure. The oxidation number of the ion uh, there is, uh, that's eight must be uh, plus six. It goes from plus six to plus two. That's a reduction in oxidation number. And there must be an oxidation occurring somewhere. And it's obvious there that oxidation, that uh, uh, bromine went from minus one to zero. That's an increase in the oxidation number. They always have to happen in pairs, so I can go to the table. That's one of the reactions from the table. And uh, the bromine reaction is another reaction from the table, both written as they are appear in the table as reduction potentials. We catalyze, cat categorize them all as reductions. And here are the two numbers from the table. So I have those reduction potentials. This one is higher up. So it can make this one go in the other direction. Okay, so let's just write that one in the other direction. And uh, now we get a point that we, we start to see, well, this is probably the way that goes then <laughs> already. We can see the spontaneous direction because this one has the higher reduction potential than this one. That one makes that one go in the other direction. I have to multiply to balance the chemical reaction. I have to make sure the electrons cancel out. So I'm going to multiply this one through by two. That's a five electron transfer. That's a two electron transfer. So to get a least common uh, multiple here, I multiply that one through by two and that one through by five to make them both 10 electron transfers. And then the electrons will cancel and I can add them together with those coefficients. So this is unbalanced. And now it's balanced. There's the two on all these compounds, so that went to 16, and there's the 10, which is five times that reaction added together, and that's the balanced chemical reaction of this, and that reaction is spontaneous in that direction. It's a 10 electron transfer. 
The voltage we can get by adding the half cell potentials once I have them written in the right direction. So I change the sign as appropriate, add the two half cells. Notice I did not multiply that by two and that by five. So this is another difference between using the free energy thermodynamic parameters and voltage. Voltage is not an extensive property. <laughs> I know you hate it when I say stuff like that. Voltage doesn't matter on the exact amount of stuff that is there. It matters on the difference between the two sides, the ratio. So if I have a pound of copper and a pound of zinc, that's one potential. If I have half a pound and half a pound, that's the same potential but not the same free energy. You know, energy is extensive. It then depends on how much is there. Potential tells you the potential for one to go from one side to the other. Thermodynamics, free energy tells you where it will end up and how much goes from one side to the other. The how much part matters is the extensive property. The intensive property, independent of amount, is voltage. That just says they want to go, not how much will go. Well, where do I keep track of how much will go? Well, that was that N in the, uh, the relationship. That's where I put in the 10 to, say, to make this the extensive property from this intensive property. And I can do that uh, calculation minus, importantly, because this is the spontaneous direction, minus 10 times Faraday's constant times that voltage is the free energy difference for that reaction. And you know that looks like something I would like you to be able to do. Uh, this is the foreign thing, but this is the familiar thing, to me anyway, and probably to you too. So going from the foreign thing to the familiar thing is something that I would like you to be able to do on an exam. Um, so again, this is all I wanted to get to is if the potential is not in the standard state, and we already got that, we already went to there, we can get potentials even if they are not in the standard state. And not being in the standard state sometimes gives you a potential. We compared standard state copper at one molar to non-standard state copper at 0.1 molar, and we said there's a potential energy difference between those two. What is it? Well, we could calculate it. So um, I'm just going to write down the various expressions that we know. So delta G is minus RT ln K. Uh, that means, oops, I'm going a little fast. Uh, I, I don't, let's just get to the results. I don't care if you can derive these things. I just want to get to the results look similar. So I can have a relationship between ln K and delta G. I can also have an ln K versus potential difference relationship. That's possible. I just remove the um, uh, quantitative part to make that uh, independent of uh, n. And here again, I have, well, if you have want to measure a potential that's not in standard conditions, you do the same thing you did with the delta G. You take the delta G in standard conditions and you add the contribution for the non-standard state, the Q the reaction quotient. So you just do the exact same thing uh, here. You say, I'm going to take the standard state. I'm going to modify it by this amount to get the reaction state. So this is the ratio. This is Q products over reactants. So I can write two different concentrations there and get the modifier for the standard. So we could have calculated the concentration this factor Q, when we had one molar and 0.1 molar in that uh, those two situations, we would have written there the um, uh, one molar over uh, 0.1. Uh, we'd have to write uh, the reaction down and decide which way we we're going to write it and um, <laughs> pick a product and reactant. Uh, I'm not going to give you the, the two similar ones. We'll do It's in a chem quiz, but we won't get to it. Um, in general, we'll have an actual reaction that you can write a, a Q for, and you won't have to think what's the more concentrated, what's the more 
dilute one. We would just give you the concentrations and the reaction. So you have products and reactants and you can put in a cue that's obvious, you know, to scratch your head and figure out what is the product and what is the reactant. We could figure it out because we could rationalize does, should this be bigger or smaller than this if it's the concentration cell? And we could uh, figure that out. But here's what it looks like. If the concentrations are not one molar, then put, then put the concentrations in. So you take the standard state, voltage difference, this group of constants, and then Q for the reaction, products over reactants. And those concentrations that are non-standard, obviously if they're both one, then that part goes to zero. And of course you are at the standard state. But if you're at Q, different than the standard state, then put those guys in. Okay. All right. That's all you are responsible for on the exam in already two days. Holy crap. And uh, tomorrow we will do one of our uh, reviews and um, uh, go over uh, like, like we do a bunch of chem quizzes, a bunch of review slides to uh, help you prepare for the final. Um, uh, the UGSIs, are you guys going to do a review? Boy, there's hardly any time. Yeah, Lord have mercy. Uh, so there's some mumbling in the room here that the UGSIs will try to have a review tomorrow uh, late afternoon, early evening. So you can come and ask your questions there. Um, I will be available for questions uh, tomorrow, obviously, um, uh, because that's my standard office hour anyway. Uh, so good luck. Uh, uh, we'll see you tomorrow for our last day. Uh, fill out your course evaluations, um, uh, spay and neuter your pets. Uh, <laughs> we'll, <laughs> I'm just doing all the PSAs. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>